Shelton Adelson has reinvented the tourism wheel. He has challenged the status quo at every turn, and his ideas have been wildly successful. I'd like to spend the next few minutes discussing them with him. Perhaps he'll tell me the secret of his success and I can be wildly successful too one day. Please welcome the chairman of the Las Vegas Sands Corporation, Mr. Sheldon Adelson. Do you want to try this one? We can talk Come like on. that, <laughs> Come a little closer. Another microphone, please. It's working. It is working? Yeah, that's right. Something's working. This one's working? Okay. Very good. Thank you for your patience. The roots of this amazing success story, if I have my facts straight, begin way back in your childhood when you began working for a living at a very early age. But things really took I was off. Because I was born at a very early age. Like most of us. Yeah. But things, like all of us. <laughs> things really took off in 1979 when you developed the Condex Computer Trade Show in Las Vegas. And what I wanted to ask you was I know that was a great success, but was it the source of some kind of an epiphany for the things you did afterwards? No. So, what. How's that for a thorough answer? Uh, very good and brief and to the point. Huh? But the point is that Las Vegas, until well, then, I've been was... Short, I've been short all my life anyway. <laughs> Las Vegas was known then for, well, two things that we can mention. Uh, gambling uh, is one, and uh, big name entertainment was another, and a few other things we can't mention. But when you purchased <laughs> the Sands Hotel and Casino... Well, go ahead. You'll, I'm, I'm sure you'll feel well, free to mention I don't know whatever there is. <laughs> when you purchased the if Sands Hotel... If you watch Hotel, the Pawn Stars... In the States, yes. the program, yes. it turns out Las Vegas is very interesting. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite programs, Pawn yeah. Stars, yeah, uh, it especially is. the name. Yep. Yeah. You all know that on the History Channel, Pawn Stars. If you don't, you should uh, watch, watch it. It's, it. A great it's show. very interesting. You transformed Las Vegas by making it not only a center of entertainment, of gambling, you turned it into a center for the convention and exhibition industry. What convinced you that that kind of change would succeed there? Well, the fact that I was Las Vegas' biggest customer when I was in the trade show business uh, convinced me that Las Vegas had a great opportunity if we integrated the, what's known internationally as the mice, as mice. We don't use that term in the United States. It's used primarily in Asia. Mice is uh, meetings, incentives, conferences, or conventions and exhibitions. But and how did you know, or what convinced you that it would take off in Las Vegas? People were going there for one specific reason, well, not for that. Uh, I produced the show in 1978, a year before I, did, I created Comdex. And it was a show that I had moved around from city to city, we call it rotating. And we experienced a particular growth uh, not a curve, but a growth trend. And when I went to Las Vegas, I, I don't know why I went to Vegas that year. It's probably no other, no other dates available. So I brought it to Vegas, and I saw a 50% spike in both the exhibitors and attendees. And then the following year, I went to Chicago. That was in 79. And I saw that it just continued the trend that I had exper that I experienced prior to going to Vegas, so I did some research, and I discovered that people who want to go to uh, people who want to go to a convention want the opportunity to have fun at night, to do something different than go to the classical hospitality suite and uh, go and get drunk. They want entertainment. They want great restaurants. They want, uh, it, as long as you have a lot of tourism infrastructure. You have, in Las Vegas, you have a variety of restaurants, you have a variety of entertainment, you have a variety of everything. Now, the convention business was not the only business that I've been in regarding tourism. I've been in business, Mike was in business 52 years, I've been in business coming up uh, in two months, 68 years. 
And I've been in every aspect of tourism. I've been a tour operator. I've been a consolidator. I've been in retail travel. I've been in charter airlines. Um, I'm very big on using aircraft. Today, we have the equivalent of what LL was. We have 18 or 19 aircraft that we use for our, our various uh, locations to bring customers in. And uh, we can fly people nonstop from Asia to Vegas. And uh, we use a lot of aircraft around Singapore and Macau. So I have, I have a lot of background, particularly in tour operating, uh, from, from prior years. And uh, so combine that with the mice business, with the convention business, and it was obvious to me that Las Vegas, what we needed was a combination of amenities, of uh, attractions, and today what we call an integrated resort. So shopping was the consumer experience that I felt was a was a critical uh, was a critical component of the integrated resort. So this combination of uh, components. I'm speaking, but, ah, you're right. Okay, you gotta get close. This combination is where it's at in terms of not only integrated resort, but also perhaps creating a kind of critical mass that makes a specific tourist location or destination take off? Yes. A, a, a critical mass, for instance, if you wanna have a lot of conventions, you gotta have the facilities, you gotta have the meeting rooms and ballrooms so that you could go from one room to another without having to leave the room, reset the room for a banquet, and then come back in. So you need a whole combination of facilities. For that, you need the amount of land that it takes to build one of these. Our typical 3,000-room uh, integrated resort is about seven to 10 million square feet. You need a lot of space. Now, you prove the concept, if I'm not mistaken, with the Venetian in Las Vegas, the concept of the integrated resort. Yes. But you talk about a lot of space, and the next project you took on, which was developing the Kotai Strip in, in Macau, really expanded the horizons of this concept of a lot of space for a lot of activities. If I'm not mistaken, you've put up tens of thousands of hotel rooms and hundreds of shops in that area, and it's not even finished yet. The thing keeps on growing. There are half a million people coming to visit on some weekends in Macau. And yet, casinos are only 4% of the business. Now, people think of you as a gambling... 4% of the space. Of the space, pardon right. me. The space, not the business. <laughs> okay, an important point. Thank God. <laughs> here we are, I'm making a local call to, to the heavens. We're here in Jerusalem. It's an interesting fact, though, that 4% of the space, obviously, people are spending a lot of time elsewhere. What is it that makes this concept, this huge concept in Kotai Strip, work? Well, it's rather simple. I, I, I don't believe everybody will think it's simple, but I'm telling you it's simple. Um, if you follow the practice of changing the way people do things, success will follow you like your shadow. You can't get rid of it can't get rid of it, you can't push it away, you can't tell it to go away. Success will follow you, for sure. Uh, what I've done is create something new. I've taken all the various components and put them in one location so they can be experienced. I had a friend of mine that came to a show and uh, he really didn't have much to do because his wife was attending the show as an attendee, the jewelry show. And he came in on a Thursday, and on Monday he said to me, hey Sheldon, how's the weather out? I said, what do you mean, how's the weather out? You don't know? He said, no. He said, I've been here since Thursday, there was no need to go outside. I go and I get, while my wife is out working, I, I go get a massage every day, then I do this and I do that. We meet our friends for dinner every night, there's no reason to, to, to leave. And as uh, Chum Lee said, we hope to be able to do that in Korea. Actually, why does it succeed? Why, why did I believe that, that uh, Kotai in Macau will succeed? It's very simple. You look at the critical mass that was created in a place called Las Vegas. 
there are 25 to 30 mega resorts on the Las Vegas Strip. There are total, they comprise about an average of 3,000 rooms each. That's uh, 75, 80,000 rooms. And uh, out of a total of 150,000 sleeping rooms in the entire city, on strip, off strip. And that critical mass brings a total of about 40 million visitors at its peak. And I think we just finished 2012, just a few months ago, and I think we had 40 million, 40 million people. So all you had to do was just duplicate. If Las Vegas was picked up with some very large slings and some very large helicopters, picked up like this little table here, and you picked it up from Las Vegas and you flew it over to Asia, the question is, would it succeed? Well, the answer is obvious, it has. Oh, yeah. But what I don't understand is this. Okay, it's one thing to create that kind of a resort tourism empire, if you will, in Las Vegas, in a culture with which you're familiar, in a business environment that is home to you. It's another thing to take the concept and transplant it thousands of miles in the direction of Asia, working with a different kind of governmental system, working with a different kind of local culture and consumer culture. How did you break down the barriers of mistrust and convince the authorities there that it was time to give you the green light? Because in, in Macau, they already had uh, a culture of gaming. There was a monopoly in, in the gaming field uh, by a gentleman, very well known, Stanley, uh, Stanley Ho, and he was there for over, he had a monopoly for over 40 years. So just like Las Vegas, they were very casino-centric, and they didn't understand that money is fungible, that anybody running the casinos needs to bring in other tourism that are looking for other things. When you take surveys, what are the two most important first and second uh, uh, aspirations of the tourist? One is shopping, two is sightseeing. Now, you, if you have a lot of that, and the Asians have a tendency, a propensity to game a lot, so you combine all of that, and then we introduce the subject of tourism. Uh, we have uh, uh, one property, the, the multiple buildings across from the Venetian has, I think, about 350 meeting rooms, breakout rooms. We have in uh, Marina Bay Sands 250 breakout rooms. In the Marina Bay Sands, the ballrooms and the meeting rooms are booked typically six months in advance. There isn't a city in the world that can't benefit by having uh, a lot of infrastructure for mice. So you've done it now with that concept in Macau. You're doing it in Singapore. What's the future look like to you? How much more potential do you see in Asia for your kind of development of well, tourism? Well, as Chan Lee mentioned, he was, he's helping us in terms of uh, bringing this to the attention of the Korean government. We'd like to do Korea, South Korea. We don't want to do North Korea. <laughs> this may happen. <laughs> they already have a casino there. Stanley Hill opened a casino in North Korea, but only for the special people. Uh, we'd like to do Japan, we'd like to do uh, Vietnam, we'd like to do Thailand, and possibly Taiwan. I don't believe China will ever allow an expanded gaming presence on the mainland. It just, it's there in Macau, and uh, the Chinese government committed that it'll be there for 50 years, only 12 of which have, have elapsed. You know, there's an, an Israeli... There's another one. We're, we're looking to do 12 3,000-room properties, sort of a half of Las Vegas Strip, in Madrid. Madrid. We were just there yesterday. We, look, we, we have a site in Madrid, uh, 1,000, 1,200 hectares, and we're talking about putting up 12 3,000-room properties, uh, 36,000 rooms, with all the critical mass that we need. Maybe as many, it'll become the convention center of the world. We'll put an average of uh, 200 uh, breakout rooms plus ballrooms in each of the 12 properties. 
that'll give us uh, 2,400 meeting rooms. So in, in this room, uh, it, this will be the equivalent of three or four meeting rooms. Sounds like business is booming and will continue to Well, boom. we could do that. We need a few, we need, as uh, Charm said, a public, and Mike said, a public-private partnership. We need the infrastructure, we need the roadways, we need the subways, we need the electricity, all of the utilities, and of course we need lower tax rates. So uh, the Spanish government is very supportive, and what we'd like to do is create the, what we're calling as a working title, Euro Vegas. Just like Cotai Strip is the uh, Las Vegas of the Far East. Well, we're still waiting for uh, Israeli Vegas, but uh, until that happens, it doesn't mean you haven't been involved here. In fact, you've been involved in a very different way in this country. Not only by giving it support in general, but specifically by becoming the principal benefactor of an amazing program called Taglit Birthright Israel. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it brings young Jews from around the world on free 10-day trips to Israel in order to connect with this country and connect with their own Jewish identity. I know that the question of Judaism and connection with Judaism is central in your life, but do you also, in a weird way, perhaps, see programs like Taglit as something that will help generate more tourism in the future for this country? We brought in three, 350,000. We got, in, my wife and I, my wife Miriam and I, got involved with Taglit about halfway through its existence. It started 13 years ago, and we got in about six, seven years ago. And uh, we think it's, it's the most effective connector between one generation of Jews to another. The last count through the end of uh, uh, 2012 was 350,000 youngsters that came. Tens of thousands of marriages uh, have, uh, have resulted from that. We were at an event on Saturday evening before we left to stop in, uh, in Spain yesterday and, and to come here. And that couple came over to me and said that she went on birthright in 2004 and she met her husband who lived five minutes away from where she lived in California. Yeah. And they had to go on birthright to meet. So you're telling people be fruitful, multiply, and create more Jewish tourists? Yes. <laughs> Seems to be working. Create more Jewish people. Huh? <laughs> Sheldon. Listen, I'm, I'm a Zionist. A Zionist for those tourism people that don't know what it means is somebody who believes in a homeland for the Jewish people. Every other ethnic group throughout the world has their own homeland. This is our homeland. It's been our homeland. And we're trying to keep it that way. And by doing so, we are sending approximately half of the Jewish youngsters from the United States. That 80% of all the, the birthright participants come from the United States and or North America. It's only uh, a few thousand coming out of Canada, but for the most part, of all the kids that have gone, uh, and there's about 100,000 Jewish youngsters, that are Jewish kids, of course they're very young, that are born every year. It's like I said before, everybody's born very young. And uh, so if you take the eight-year category of eligibility from 18 to 26, there are, uh, eight, eight times eight, six, there are 640,000 kids within that time frame. So we're trying to get, we're only sending 50%. We're only able to send 50% of the people that apply. So it's a little more than 50%, about 60. So for every kid that goes, there's 1.7 applicants. So we're doing everything we can. I went on a fundraising uh, a visit last week uh, and raised a few million dollars to help build up the, uh, uh, the war chest so that we could send more kids. And there's also 60,000 youngsters from the military, boys and girls, that go on the buses with the foreigners. And by the way, a lot of marriages have resulted from that as well. So we have mixed marriages, foreigners with Israelis. You've got this card of togetherness up your sleeve in every angle. Right. <laughs> Good for you. Shelton, you're almost 80 years old. That may be a secret to some of you. 
And it doesn't look like you're slowing well, down at all. Well, 80 is the best 60. <laughs> it doesn't look like you're slowing down at all. I just want to ask you one final question. What other plans do you have in the future for challenging the status quo in the tourism industry? Well, uh, to, I wasn't able to continue. We were too successful in, in Kotai. When we first, I thought we were being exiled to, the, to this uh, land between the two islands. Macau is not an island. It's, part of it is a peninsula. There are three bridges to the first island, and there was a causeway connecting the second island. The name Kotai came from CO from Kalawain and TAI from Taipa, the two islands. So I went out there, and I went back to the government. I said, where's the land? They said, well, you have to be a visionary to see the land. I said, where is it? I said, I went out there, there's swamps and there's a bay. They said, well, the land is under the bay. <laughs> you gotta find a way to bring it up. So instead of bringing it up, we didn't lower the river, we raised the bridge. So what we did was bring in thousands or hundreds of thousands of barges with sand and we filled it all in. We filled in several hundred acres. And so we built up the land. And uh, the, my original plan called for 20 places, 3,000 rooms each, 60,000 rooms. So we did it in three phases. So we did the first phase. We still haven't finished it yet. Uh, where that Parisian that, that we saw on, on, the, uh, on the screen is our next project. I'm doing a million square foot uh, retail mall then I'm going to do a St. Regis uh, condo or co-op apartments. And, uh, uh, but what happened was that all of the naysayers who said, oh, he's never going to succeed, he'll go into bankruptcy, those people now are uh, uh, fighting to cut off their right arms to get a piece of land in Gote. I bet they are, because obviously you're a man who thinks small, and they can see that. Yeah, well, you just look at me. <laughs> Sheldon, you have made your mark as one of the world's most innovative tourism entrepreneurs. And in recognition of your achievements, the Jerusalem International Tourism Summit wishes to honor you today with the Jerusalem Summit Award for Innovation and Excellence in Global Tourism. And to do the honors, to make the presentation, I'd like to call upon several people to join us up here on stage. First of all, Israel's Minister of Tourism, Dr. Uzi Landau, Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat, the chairman of the Jerusalem Development Authority, Moshe Leon, and your partner in the changing world of tourism and in changing the world of tourism, Dr. Miriam Adelson. Miri, please come up. And also, please join us two representatives from Taglit Birthright Israel who are in our audience here today. most beautiful city in the world, Jerusalem. Sheldon, congratulations. Thank you very much. This is a landmark day for you in tourism. It's a landmark day for us to be able to honor you. And it's a landmark time in your life. As I mentioned before, your 80th birthday is fast approaching. My 60th birthday. <laughs> and to celebrate all of these events, we'd like to present you a very special gift. And it's coming right now. Special gift, where are you? I'm holding it. No, I'm holding I don't her. mean that special gift. I'm holding it, but I already have it. We have three unique gentlemen who are supposed to join us up here, and I believe they're on their way. They're looking for them in the back room. Sheldon, I think they're hiding in one of your integrated resorts, and they don't want to leave. they got to be pretty Here they come now, ladies that. and gentlemen. Thank you. 
Maestro, music please. Oh, this song sounds familiar. Everyone can clap like this. I say, la vida need and son montato to say a door, to say a door. For la dove dispetto in cor in grato, chi fa non può, chi fa non può. For la cogenta fuoco ma si fuggi, de la sesta, de la sesta. E non te cori e prese e non ti struggi, a rinconar, a rinconar, e a me, e a me, troppo e a me. Congratulations, Mr. Adelson. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, and uh, those wonderful artists join us from the Kotai Strip. They're part of the entertainment team working there with Sheldon and his company. We thank you for joining us. I, uh, I have some bad news. We were scheduled to have a coffee break now, but we were ru are running incredibly late, so we're going to ask you to join us in giving up on your coffee break, and we promise you that we will make up for it at lunch, which will be served shortly. Thank you so much for your cooperation and understanding. <laughs> As if you have a choice. <laughs> 